So shockwave therapy is gaining more and more traction in the world of physiotherapy. Today we're going to dive into the evidence of where it's being used, including some fields you may not have thought of. Let's dive in. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So shockwave therapy, or extracorporeal shockwave therapy to be precise, is gaining more and more popularity in the world of physiotherapy. And I think it's great. Electrotherapy has had a bad reputation for a while, particularly things like ultrasound, where the evidence behind it has been quite poor. Well, shockwave is a modality where the evidence seems to be on the up. So how does it work? Well, shockwave therapy delivers high energy sound waves into the tissues. D'Agostino et al. in 2015 highlight that shockwave has a main role in collagen synthesis and proliferation, which is very important in tissue healing, particularly muscles and tendons. And in fact, it is musculotendinous tissue which seems to be the key focus for shockwave therapy at this time. So let's dive into the evidence, starting with how effective shockwave therapy is for tendon rehab. So one of the biggest advocates for shockwave therapy is the systematic review by Manny Babu et al. in 2015. They narrowed down their review into 13 studies focusing on three particular conditions, greater trochanteric pain syndrome, patellar tendinopathy and Achilles tendinopathy. And from their research they had four main findings. For greater trochanteric pain, there was moderate evidence to suggest that shockwave therapy was more effective than home training and corticosteroid injection in the short term, less than 12 months, and in the long term, more than 12 months. For patellar tendinopathy, there was limited evidence to suggest that shockwave was more effective than alternative non-operative treatments, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and physiotherapy but there was moderate evidence to suggest that it was equal to patellar tenotomy surgery in the long term. For Achilles tendinopathy, they found moderate evidence indicating that in the short term, shockwave is more effective than eccentric loading for insertional Achilles tendinopathy and equal to eccentric loading for mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. They also found that there was moderate evidence to suggest that combining shockwave and eccentric loading in mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy may produce superior outcomes to eccentric loading alone. Now, in more recent times, there has been more supportive evidence. Valence and Malieras in 2019 found that shockwave therapy had an immediate condition pain modulation effect in patients with Achilles tendinopathy. So they completed shockwave therapy with 20 participants, where sessions were five to nine days apart. They found that shockwave significantly increased a patient's pain threshold when they put pressure on the treated site after the shockwave was completed. This might suggest, for example, that it could be used just ahead of someone being able to do their Achilles tendinopathy rehab where they might have less pain because of the shockwave in order to do their exercises. So the researchers found a couple of limitations of their study that they would like to change. They mentioned that they would have liked to have included a control group, perhaps a placebo or a sham shockwave group. Therefore, with some participants, they turn the machine on and use true shockwave. And with some participants, they use the machine, but the machine was turned off. That would have given a really good indication of the true effectiveness of shockwave versus a placebo effect. Yes, also, the study had a lower number of participants. And I'd also really like to have known how long that immediate pain modulation effect took place over. For example, was it just a couple of minutes or was it for the rest of the day or two days? That also would have given us some really good ideas about the indications of its use. Then we have Zeng et al. 2020, who looked to investigate the effectiveness of shockwave therapy for tennis elbow, lateral epicondylopathy, through their meta-analysis. And they included nine studies in their review. So they found that shockwave therapy was not able to create a significant difference in pain reduction for patients who had true shockwave therapy and those who had placebo or sham shockwave therapy where the machine wasn't turned on. However, they did find that true shockwave therapy was able to generate a 50% reduction in pain in most people. So that's interesting. Now, we also know how important grip strength is for tennis elbow. And in three of the nine studies the authors investigated, they found that grip strength did improve for the patients who had true shockwave therapy compared to those who had placebo placebo shockwave therapy at the 12 week to three month mark. So that's really promising as well. So there's some evidence for the use of shockwave therapy for tendon issues. But here's something I wasn't expecting. Cabanas Valdez et al, a group out of Barcelona in Spain, have created two really firm systematic reviews highlighting the use of shockwave therapy 
for upper limb and lower limb spasticity management. Their 2019 systematic review focused on the use of Shockwave for lower limb spasticity management in patients post-stroke, and they included 278 patients in their review. They concluded that shockwave therapy was a good adjunct for these patients, finding that it increased ankle range of movement and that it improved lower limb function, and did so in a safe manner with no adverse effects. And their 2020 meta-analysis focused on upper limb spasticity management amongst 764 patients. And again, they found that shockwave therapy was effective in treating patients with upper limb spasticity issues, finding that it was a good adjunct to conventional therapy. So in summary, it seems like we have really good evidence to highlight the use of shockwave therapy in spasticity management in a neurological environment. We have some evidence that shockwave therapy is useful in a musculoskeletal environment for certain tendinopathic problems. However, it's clear that we definitely don't have that slam dunk piece of evidence that shows us that it's definitely better than sham or placebo shockwave therapy when the machine is turned off, or that there's a very specific condition that it works really well for, or even what settings should we be using on the machine. I'd also really like to see what the effects are on other conditions like frozen shoulder or plantar fasciitis, something which is not tenderness in nature. So we have some evidence, but as a profession, we need to be investigating more. So guys, hope you've enjoyed this video. We'd love it if you smash that like button, subscribe to the channel for all our updates, and of course, check out our website, clinicalphysio.com, or our social media channels, including Instagram, at clinicalphysio, for all of our best content. I'm Carlid. Thank you so much for watching. See you really soon here on Clinical Physio.